purpose of this video is to outline the steps involved in hypothesis testing, the steps that a researcher goes through when analyzing data that have been collected in a study. Step 1. The research hypothesis. The researcher starts by clearly identifying the research hypothesis, the relationships that will be studied, the treatment that will be tested. So for example, Let's say a nurse researcher wants to determine the effectiveness of internet-based information that includes text and video for people with diabetes compared with a traditional pamphlet. The research hypothesis is that patients who use the internet education will learn more than those who get the pamphlet. Step 2. The null hypothesis. This is research, remember, so the researcher is conducting a study to learn something new. Behind every research hypothesis is the null hypothesis. It's a neutral statement that reflects the perspective that we don't make a conclusion until the data have been analyzed. In this case, the null hypothesis is that there will be no difference in learning between the two groups. This is like the legal system where we start with the perspective innocent until proven guilty. The null hypothesis is never written down, it's implied. We run the stats test to determine if we can reject the null hypothesis or if we have to accept it. Step number three, determine the levels of measurement for the variables that are involved. This is important because they dictate what stats tests can be done. In our example, learning is measured with a 10 item test. The level for this variable is ratio. Scores could range from zero to 10 so the researcher can calculate a total score for each patient as well as a group average for each group. The independent variable is the type of education, internet-based or pamphlet, so it's nominal. Step four, select the appropriate test statistic. We do this by asking for some details about the study. What type of testing is going to be done? How many groups are involved and how often are they being tested? Are we looking for a relationship between variables or comparing differences in groups? What are the levels of measurement for the variables? In this case, we're comparing differences in the mean scores regarding learning for two groups. We're testing them once, after they've had the internet or the pamphlet, for two weeks. Why are we asking all these questions? These questions will determine what statistical test the researcher uses. There's a stats test that's appropriate to every situation. The researcher in this case will use the independent t-test, but we'll have more on that later. Step five, the level of significance. In every study, there's a risk of error creeping in and influencing results. Researchers set the level of risk that they're willing to accept. Usually in nursing, 0.05 is the risk that we'll accept, meaning the chance of getting a particular result by chance or fluke is just five out of, ten, out of 100. The researchers always set the level of statistical significance before the study starts. And as I said, in nursing, it's usually set at 0.05. Step six, analyze the results. Let's say the mean score for the internet patients was eight out of 10, and the mean for pamphlet patients was 6.5. It looks like there's a difference, but could this be just a fluke or a quirk of this particular sample? Possibly. It's time to do the stats test to see if there's a statistically significant difference between our two groups. In the days before easy access to software like SPSS, statisticians calculated their results by hand. You'll recall that when we plot scores on the normal curve, the chance of getting a score at the extreme tails is very unlikely. For example, the chances of getting 99% in statistics or being an adult and being just four feet tall are very remote. The probability is very low of getting those scores. It's the same with results from statistics tests. Statisticians have done many calculations and they've identified points on the curve that serve as cutoff points or critical regions. The statistician would draw the normal curve, plot the results of the statistical test on the curve, and if the stats test result fell beyond the critical point into the extreme or critical region, they would reject the null hypothesis and declare that they have a statistically significant finding. That's all they would know, that the result was stati statistically significant or not. We don't know the exact probability of error, just that the risk is very small, small enough to be acceptable. Those critical points or numbers are listed in tables in the back of every statistics textbook. You need to know what stats test is being used and the degrees of freedom for that particular test to use the tables. To sum all that up, 
If you calculate by hand or using a calculator and your statistical test result is greater than the critical or tabled value in the book, you reject the null hypothesis and declare that you have a statistically significant result. There's a second way now to see if your results are statistically significant. By using software such as SPSS, which can calculate if the result is significant and the exact probability of error. And this makes things very simple. You simply look at the output generated by SPSS and you look at the P, or probability value, that SPSS reports in the output table. If the p-value is low, the null hypothesis must go. By low, we mean less than 0 0.05, the level of significance that is usually set in nursing, referred to earlier. You have a statistically significant result. You have results that are supporting the research hypothesis. So that's the process a researcher goes through when analyzing data collected in a quantitative study. Let's put that into practice with a quick summary. The research hypothesis was that patients would learn more effectively with internet-based education than they would with the traditional pamphlet. The null hypothesis was that, that there would be no difference in the, in the amount of learning between the two groups. Researchers set the level of significance at 0 0.05, assuming a two-tailed test in this course, always. They opted to use the independent t-test, the test statistic that compares differences in results of groups. One group of researchers used a calculator, and they ran the t-test equation. They obtained this result, t equals 3.6. There's one really important point here. That number has no meaning by itself. We have to compare it to a critical value. The degrees of freedom in this case was 20. The researchers turn to the t-test tables in the back of their stats book, and they find the critical value for rejecting the null hypothesis at the 0 0.05 level. The table tells them that for degrees of freedom 20, the critical value is 2.08. Their obtained value, you'll remember, was 3.6. That's a lot larger than the critical value, so they can reject the null hypothesis. They have a statistically significant result. A second group of researchers are using SPSS to run the same t-test. They get the same result, t equals 3.6. Remember again, that number has no meaning by itself. But the researchers also get some extra information because they used SPSS. They get a p-value, and in this case, SPSS tells them p equals 0 0.02. Right away, without having to look at a stats book, we can see that they can reject the null hypothesis because when the p-value is low, lower than 0 0.05, the null must go. They have a statistically significant result. So there's a statistically significant difference in learning between patients. Those who receive the internet-based education learn more than those who receive the pamphlet. This is pretty complex content. You will likely have to think about it for a while. I hope that was helpful. Thank you.